everyone. It's Emily Williams here, the founder of I Heart My Life and your host of the I Heart My Life show. And today is going to be a super inspirational interview with the incredible Laura Wright. She runs an amazing company called Epic at Sales, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, making sales easy. And I also love how she describes sales as love. So if you've ever felt scared of selling or felt like you were sleazy when you got on the phone with a potential client, this episode is for you. So Laura is affectionately known as the Epic Sales Ninja, and she's all about helping women master the art of sales in a way that feels good and actually works. She's helped over 4,000 artists sell tens of thousands of work, thousands of dollars worth of work, selling and filling multi-million dollar events, turning over six-figure profits, and much, much more. And I know that you've helped people create millions in revenue. (laughs) And so we're going to talk about all of that today. So welcome, Laura. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Amazing. So before we get into sales and what you do now, I really find that everyone has their I Heart My Life story. So I'd love to know a little bit about how you got here. You mentioned having a big redemption story, as you call it. So I'd love for you to share with the audience a little bit about your journey. Yeah. So it's funny because I think a lot of people think you have to have the masses rags to riches stories. And I don't always think you need one, but I do actually have one. (laughs) So uh, my leading up to it story was that just very precocious at a young age, I was always like the youngest, the first, the fast. And in the midst of doing that, I started a real estate investment company. Um, I had been working like large events and doing lots of like big things. And then 9-11 happened and I had a moment to kind of change what I was doing. And so I left corporate and decided to begin this real estate business. And in the midst, I built a multi seven figure business. We had lots of partners. We had lots of construction crews. And then 2008 happened over here in the States and um, all of that bubble burst happened and turned into here I was with no income, massive debt, like $550,000 of debt. Um, And we had just retired my boyfriend at the time, husband now, so he could go back and fulfill his life and his dreams and become a chef. So I found myself in a really stuck spot. And I think there was a question you had asked me at one point during our connection, which was like, how do you change things? And I think what I did, I don't recommend. I didn't change things right away. I kind of floundered and I went and stayed behind the scenes of other people's companies and I built them up. And then I had this moment of reckoning where things had gotten stable again, and I decided that I needed to believe in myself. So um, I had kind of a a month of, I'm going to change everything. I changed my business model, my services, my everything. I put my head down, and I did the one thing I knew would work. And what that was, was I did sales. And so for an entire month, I just sold my booty off. And I mean, in a really loving, wonderful way, (laughs) I did 37 sales calls, which I don't really recommend to anyone else. Um, I brought on 13 new clients and I banked twice what I had made the month before, but I booked out an entire six figures and got myself into a place of believing again. But I think what's really important to hear is that I got myself out of my debt, but I didn't stop. So most people tend to, when they have big crushing weight of debt, they wait, they want to bring the money in and they want to, you know, figure it out first. I made sure that I reinvested in myself along the way. I kept myself going. I tried new things and have to say, I managed to pay off all of that debt. In fact, I have a final payment that's going out at the end of this month for something that just popped back up again from that because real estate sticks around. (laughs) But I managed to buy the house of my dreams, marry the man that I was with. We have a young who I love who is six, almost seven, and I do heart my life. I have moments that we kind of like, like pinch myself back from vacation at the Bahamas life, and it's all because I just chose to rely on my skills and really step up and serve others. Mm, Wow, I love that. So there's so many amazing nuggets in there. I want to kind of break that down a bit. So how when you when all that happened back in 2008, I imagine there were at least a few days, if not months of being like, Oh, my God, what am I supposed to do now? I worked so hard to build this business. And now, you know, what am I going to do? So can you describe that period of time and really how long it took to kind of pull yourself out of that? 
Yes. So it's funny because I remember like the down on my knees moment that people talk about. I legit had one of those. Um, right when everything was really terrible, uh, my now husband didn't actually know how bad it was. He has subsequently told me he did. He was just waiting for me to come to him. But I had a day where I locked myself out of the house in the winter with a really tiny coat. And luckily our pup was inside, but I locked myself out and I had like half a bar and my phone. And I'm like, this is it. Like, this is rock bottom. I have no idea what to do. I have no idea how to pay bills. I have no idea, like, how to give us groceries. Like, we almost lost everything. And I remember crying and thinking, you can't stay here. You have to figure something out. And so I actually did what I highly recommend to a lot of people is I hired a coach. And it's funny because most often I don't say, oh, you know, just go buy your way out of it. But what I really thought was, Somebody out there had figured this out before, and if I could leverage what they knew, if I could leverage their belief that I could do it, I could start to do it. So I hired a coach. I remember crying because I couldn't figure out how to get the $100 a month, <laughs> which I now, I look at, you know, I've invested more than six figures in my own coach just in the last six months, but I remember thinking that $100 was so hard, and what I did was... I went to what I was safe with, and I, again, don't always recommend it, but what it helped me do was it built a foundation, and I think not stopping, like it's really hard to believe that you failed and you stopped. What I knew was I needed to reinvent myself, so what I understood was I was good at listening, I understood sales, um, I didn't know at the time I was coaching, but when I hired my coach, I started learning the coaching skills from her as well, and I think that was like a tipping point for me, and then I think... The third tipping point was after I had helped her go from 250 to a million dollars in two years and host three live events and filled multiple programs, I realized that I was playing small by just supporting her. So I decided to figure out a way to do what I did for one person for many. And that was another really big turning point for me. So you actually worked with her on her sales process. Yeah, it's so funny. So how I got hired, it was a really funny moment. Um, she, I bought a ticket into her program. Yeah. And while I was in there, she reached out and she's like, cause she knew what my story was and how I'm like, I need money. <laughs> um, and I hadn't even figured out what I was selling to people yet. So she said, Hey, you know what? Um, would you like to do some scheduling for me? And I had this moment and this is what I highly recommend to everyone is, and my husband's done this. I've done this a lot of my clients. There was an offer on the table for me that didn't match what I thought I needed but I knew there was something in it. So I said, yes, she offered me, it was $400 a month for me to schedule her client calls. And while I was doing it, I was like, oh, hey, I noticed some of your sales calls are dropping off. If you did this, they would show up. And she did that. And then suddenly it progressed and every couple of months I would do a little more until she brought me into her company to manage her sales team, to host sales calls and to coach in her programs. So I think the real big key is that I listened to that inner voice that said, this might not be what you think it is, but there's something there. And then I gave more. Each time I saw there was something that could be improved, I said, here's what we could do together. And I really came from that place of we, even though it was her company. And through that, it gave me that stepping stone and opportunity to really grow into who I am today. Wow, that's amazing. And I so relate to so many parts of your story. When I moved to London, I hired a coach as well, and I can barely afford it. I remember thinking that it was like the biggest amount of money and stretch. And I just cried the whole time because I didn't know what I was doing with my life. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, you know, remember listening to that little voice that said, okay, well, you might not have complete clarity, but you know how to do this, this and this, you know, that certain things are calling you or capturing your attention. And just starting to follow that was what really led to even more clarity. And so I think some people think that they have to have the whole thing figured out first, but that rarely happens. Never. And it's funny because I do remember that exact thing of like, I had a thriving business and it disappeared like almost literally overnight. And I was like, how do I not know what to do? And then I, this is a thing I see a lot too, when people are in corporate or they've had another business or like an, a done for you service and they want to do more strategy is that they think they have to go from you know, zero to 60 and they're at 60. So they need to stay up there. And that was actually something that was really challenging for me. But the best was to start where I was as opposed to, cause I, I wanted to go straight up to the top. And I remember seeing, I've been around in the online business for quite some time. And there's some big well-known people that I knew back in 2007, 2008, 
and they weren't who they are today. And so I think a lot of people, and there, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just who they were and they grew into who they are today. And I think a lot of people come into our online sphere and when they're running businesses, they want to start at the end where they think that person is. It took me probably three years to nail down my like tip of the spear. And then from that space, I spent the next three years mastering it. And that's where you get your real traction. Mm, I love that. Yeah. And I mean, I remember a coach telling me that I was showing up like I had four months left to live. I think those of us who oh, are ambitious, yeah. like we want everything <laughs> overnight and we don't really have a slow down button, but I see what you're saying. Like every step um, is important. So when you started working for that coach, tell us a little bit more about when you started to really get the confidence to do this with more people and how, yeah. how you started to grow your business. Yeah. So what I basically found out was there was a pattern I'd seen in my life. And this is something to always pay attention to because when you see patterns, it's actually like a universal wink of go do this. And what I, I sat down and I heard in myself was I had several times in a row help people build multi-million dollar businesses. And what happened was I didn't build it for myself. So it was really easy for me to come inside of a company and help others. And then I would walk away and yes, I benefited while we were in it, but I didn't have anything lasting for me. So I remember having a moment where I felt as though I had grown as much as I could grow within her company. She was starting to go in a different direction, which I am so grateful now at the time it felt scary. And I realized that okay, I wasn't sure what to do, but what if I could have a couple clients like her? And I wasn't still that full tilt because I was doing done for you services. Um, and so I drew on a couple other people as done for you. And that helped me actually see that wasn't the right thing. And I think that's the crucial key is I couldn't know what was right until I tried something and then tried the different thing that felt better. So I went and drew on a couple extra clients. And this time I was like, I'm going to build my foundation. And I still didn't quite do it. And then that month where I clicked over and I was like, this is going to be for me. Um, I think it comes from a deep wanting when you know like what you, I want to say have ownership over, like having a business that I can rely on when you are an employee, you, who knows what's going to happen to you. And I found myself as a subcontractor still almost having an employee experience. And I think what happened was my husband said this to me and I, I really hold on to this. I had sold, um, this is a turning point moment. I'd sold 85,000 for a client in a month. It was about 28 days. I filled an um, event for her with 143 people. Um, I signed on like two VIP days for her that were 25,000. And he said to me, he's like, why don't you just do this for yourself? And I was like, I can't, like, she's amazing. Like she's the one delivering it. I'm just selling it. And he's like, you don't have to do what she's doing, but why don't you sell what you do? Cause you can do it. And so he said, could you just create a pretend client that you sold for that is actually you, if you don't have the full confidence in you. And so I was like, okay, maybe. But what I realized was it was actually time for me to become that person as opposed to pretend. And so that's what I did in the month where I sat down and put my head down. I decided I was going to become the person that all these people that I was selling for, I thought they were so, and they are remarkable and dynamic and they knew what they were doing. Instead of just pretending I had a client like them, I decided to become that person. Mm, amazing. So tell us a little bit more about that. So how do you mm -hmm. become that person, especially in a month's time? That's not yeah. that long. That's a huge transformation. Yeah. So what do you do? Little, I'll put a little asterisk over. Do not do this. This is only the Laura should do this way. Um, I am a bridge burner. I work really well when I like cut off all possibility and I run in the new direction. So what I did to like kickstart myself into changing was I changed everything. So hubby left his job, um, which we had consciously decided to retire him. Um, I packed up my entire family when we moved from Maryland to New York uh, for 30 days, um, which means I changed everything in my world. Um, I put kiddo into a school that was way like a high, high price preschool. So I increased what my outcome needed to be for each month. And by putting that change to everything, it caused me to do different things. The other crucial thing that I did at that time was I hired a new coach and she was basically like a um, cross between a cheerleader and an ass kicker. <laughs> and I so every, yeah, I mean the best kind really. And every day she would say, how many people did you reach out to? And if I said 25, she'd say do 45. And so she 
kept me in that land of keep going. Uh, but also I changed everything around me because I knew that's my natural way to do things. Now that's for me. Most people I recommend that you build a bridge and then cross it by like slowly. But for me, I knew what would work with for me. So that's what I did a radical transformation and it caused a radical transformation outcome. Yeah, I would say <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> and so, um, how about after that point? So you have all, you're making all these calls, you have this amazing coach, you've increased the outgoings. So tell us about the trajectory of your business after that. Yeah. So what I did at that moment was I realized that I need to really solidify what I was selling. And that was something that started happening right then. Um, a big changeover that I made was, and I teach this to a lot of my clients. Um, I had one-on-one -on -one work and when I was doing all that one-on-one -on -one work, there's just, you get a cap. You can only take on so many clients in a week, in a day. Even if you raise your prices, you still get to that like stuck space. So what I ended up doing was in the next, this probably took about a full year, um, I had the idea to leverage myself with a mastermind. And I could have just jumped in and done it, but I decided to slow down. And this is really important to know when to go fast and short term and when to go slow. And so what I did was I spent almost a year refining my process, which I'm a, I'm a high quick start system breaking, not usually a process person, but I decided to like really step back and build something solid. I didn't want to constantly need every month to go crazy. So I followed up with the people that I had in the first month and over a couple more months, I brought in a few more clients. I increased my rates and I lengthened my packages so my income stabilized. And then I started doing a lot of free content, really putting myself out there. And I, I also want to say this, I still have a tiny, tiny list. Um, you don't have to have a huge community to create a lot of income. But what I did was I nurtured my people. I really, I put out lots of challenges and free content. And in the meantime, I was bringing on my one-on-ones. And within about a year's time, I'd gotten to a place where I had completely full practice, and then I offered my, my mastermind group. And what was amazing about that was I solidified what needed to be given to everyone. I saw who was around me. I had gathered up this large group of one-on-ones, and it was very easy to transition a lot of them into the current group. Um, I had created for myself you know, testimonials and people who got what I did, and I also created a little group program while I was doing it. So I was practicing doing little things. And this is the number one thing I like to say is, Stabilize your income before you go do a big launch. So while I like to do radical things, I do believe that when you have calm, stable income, whether that's one-on-one -on -one or whatever it is that you do, when you have that, you can relax and your energy is clear. And when you build a little group program or a large group program, it tends to have greater success. And that's what was another tipping point for me. So First was figuring out what was my tip of the spear, really filling in my one-on-ones, putting my head down and only doing that. And then from that space, building a small group. And then I built a larger leveraged group. And I kind of haven't looked back since. <laughs> yeah, I think that's incredible. And I love the way you described that. And I want to come back to a few of those pieces after the break. So for anyone listening, I really want to understand from your perspective, perspective excuse me, perspective, Laura, um, how you know when it's time to kind of go big and when it's time to perfect the process. Because I think that's, that's a really key piece and I really want to help break that down for people. So we'll catch up there after the break. Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Emily Williams, the founder of I Heart My Life with Laura Wright, who runs Epic X Sales. And she's an incredible sales coach. She's been talking all about her journey um, up to this point, all of the highs and all of the lows. And one of the things I really want to touch on and get more clarity about, because I think it'll help you listening, and it's also something that I'm really intrigued about, is really how you know when to go big and when to perfect the process. Because if I'm being completely honest, most of the time I just want to keep going like this. <laughs> and there are times where, you know, James, he describes me as someone who's always running up the mountain and he's behind me like chasing me. And then we finally get to the top and he realizes I'm on the next mountain. Yeah. And um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs can relate to that. Yeah. 
So tell us a little bit more about how you know and how you can differentiate between those moments. Yeah, so I think here's the thing, uh, especially when it comes to sales, everything is really your energy. So if you are in a scrambly, insecure, unstable space, it doesn't matter what you say on a call. You can say the most perfect, wonderful thing to the perfect, wonderful client, and they will feel that energy. So here's how to know when to go big and how to like look at the long run. So number one, I'm a big fan of Colby assessments, K-O-L-B-E, assessment A. I use this with all my clients. Um, and one thing I know is I am a system-breaking quick start. So I know my mode, and I bet you are too, Emily, is um, to break systems and go fast. So me knowing myself knows that my level and length of risk is higher and I can do more of that. What I encourage you to do is to learn yourself, find out more about you. And there's higher fact finders, higher follow throughs, which will make sense if you go see Colby, different call. Um, <laughs> but if you know you have longer lines with that, then you want to have yourself be much of a longer looker and you want to bring people to you that balance. And that's the crucial key. So being able to have someone around you who balances, my team calls themselves a quick start cleanup crew. So every time I go off and do that big thing, just like James Chase goes with you up the mountain, I have my team who I run up the mountain and they go behind me and catch the things. Um, it's really important to have people around you who can do that, who put things in place while you go ahead. And then also if you're a person who likes to have everything in order before you take action, it's important to bring people around like you and I who will push you to go forward. So how do you know which one to do? Well, here's what I do. Stabilized income is the number one thing because that will create an energy for you of possibility. So whether that's if you're doing done for you services or you're a coach or you're a writer or a healer, or anything that you do as your main service, I would recommend that you look at selling longer term packages that put you in a stable place for your income. When you have that, you can grow expansively because your energy is there. So what I do is this. Every single month, I do what I call a marketing moment. This satisfies my consistency that I need that I don't always feel like I want to do the long-term look. But it also satisfies my quick start where you and I want to run up the mountain and do something big. I don't always define what I'm going to do every month. I just know once a month, my team is going to help me gather together some resource packet, either a call, a PDF, or something, and I'm going to put it out to the world, and I'm going to sell something from that. The other thing I like to look at is 90 day windows, 90 days to four months, so 120 days out. Um, and actually, I'm going to say it's a little bit different. Each year at the beginning of the year, I map out everything I want for the whole year. And what I know is about a quarter of the way to halfway through, it's all going to change. But because I've defined it for a whole year, I start moving in the path of what I want. And because I got started on the path, I'm able then to choose a different route. So while we're going up the mountain, you know what the mountain looks like, so you can start running up it. So I think the most important thing is to stabilize your baseline income. I have one program that I run that basically pays for all of my basic needs. Like it you know, takes care of household, takes care of most of my team. If nothing else, this will run the business. And then I can go get creative and decide to try a new program I've never done before and there's no risk to whether people buy it or not. Mm, I love that. What an incredible description. And I also loved and appreciated how you said that by the time you get halfway through the year, everything has actually changed. Because I think a lot of people can relate to that. And I know for me, creativity is really important. So to be able to have a way to have that stability and the creativity, I think that's really, really key for people like us. Um, and my one question for you is, I know you just decided to describe it in a different way, but what was the thing that you do every month that you said? Oh, yes. I call it a marketing moment. It's funny because I don't like rigid systems of like every third Tuesday, you must do X, Y, Z. The moment there is rules put on something, I will break them. So what I do is it's a marketing moment for me and it's what keeps me consistently visible. It's either a masterclass or a training series. In fact, I'm doing one next week that's five days long, uh, but it's some way that I get to use my creativity. I get to also know what my audience wants. So when I'm running a program, I really listen to what my current clients are struggling with and whatever they need support with, I then create a 
free something, again, PDF, masterclass, training series, where I teach that and at the end I call forward to let people come on sales calls with me or I make a very specific offer. What I also want you to hear is my marketing moment every month has a sale moment attached to it. So there's never a stop in my cash flow. Every single month I have an opportunity for people to buy from me and for me to serve others. And when you have that, you don't get into feast and famine. And that's yeah, big. <laughs> that's huge. Yeah, let's break that down a little bit. So feast and famine, we know the practical reason why that's not a good thing. <laughs> um, but you mentioned energy. So can you talk a little bit about what feast and famine does for the energy that you put out into the world? Yeah, absolutely. So again, no matter how you show up, what's actually happening is the feeling that someone receives from you. So when you are desperate, when you are scrambly, this is what shows up on a sales call or in your marketing message. So I think the most important thing to do is remember one of the only things you can control in this world is actually how you feel and what you think how you respond to things. So you can, can decide if you want to feel the way you feel. So even in that moment, like me crying on the front porch, locked out of the house, like no money in the bank account, I had a moment to choose, did I want to stay feeling like that or did I want to shift into possibility? And so what I like to do is I call it managing my energy. A lot of people call it mindset work. Um, I every day decide, is this mine? Do I want to feel this way? And then when I shift my energy, I can actually come up with possibility. Because when you're stuck in the scramble, when you have what I call the crazy bitch inside, she's the one that's like, you can't do that. Or no one will buy your program. Um, you, we all know her. She lives inside. She helps us. She does sometimes help us not do things we shouldn't do. But when that's all going on, you have a moment to stop and choose. And from that energy, you always come up with aligned action. So my high, high coach recommendation is to decide every time that feeling of worry comes up, how do you decide, do you want to keep it or do you want to let go of it before you decide to take action? Because if you just take action from worry or anxiety or stress or strain, the thing that you're projecting is that. So my, I manage my energy prior to every sales call. I put myself into like my highest and best self uh, before I actually go and present on a call. I'll do the same thing. And you can control that no matter what your bank account looks like. Yeah, that was going to be my next question because I know a lot of people are curious to know how do you shift yourself into that place even if your bank account says zero or, you know, something really small and you are, uh, I don't want to use the word desperate, but that's kind of the reality. You need the money to yeah. come in in order to live, in order to keep running the business. How do you actually shift your energy? Is it really as simple as a decision? Mm -hmm. it, it starts with a decision, but here are some actual tools. So one of the first things I did that really helped my life was activate the law of polarity. It's my favorite universal law. It is like the one thing that has kept me off the edge sometimes. And I will butcher what it's meant to be, but here's what it means to me. Um, if something exists, the opposite has to exist. So if I know that I am empty bank account, completely desperate, the only way that this exists is the possibility and the knowing that a fully abundant flowing income stream, Laura, also exists. So I start to ask myself, what would she do? Like, how would she act? Your future projected self who has passed this, what would she do? If you had all the money in the bank, what would you do today? And when you start to ask yourself the question, which is wonderful, I love the human physiology, like our brains are magnificent. The fact that you can ask, how would I act if I already had the money? Whatever and you have the answer. Whatever you say is the thing to do. Yeah. I love Mike Dooley and leveraging the universe, his teachings I've like just latched into, but being able to activate that, I also think what's really, really key is to have a support network around you, to have people who are, um, there's got to be a way to say this, not struggling with you, so further down the path but they understand and they can tell you keep going. Because I think what usually happens is whatever we're vibrating in, our energy, we attract those people. So if you look around you right now today and say, who are you connected to? Those people have the same issues that you have. So when you can hook into either a mentor or a mastermind group, a group of people who are 
thriving, striving, achieving, and have maybe been there before, they can help pull you forward as opposed to if you look around and you have naysayers around you who say you can't do it, I would recommend removing yourself from those situations so that you can take the action that you know how to take. Beautiful. Yeah. And I know that for me, that's been such an important part of my journey as well is to have that support system, whether it's coaches or the groups and even the group we're in now, we're with colleagues who are creating seven figure months. And, you know, there was a point just a few years ago where I didn't believe my coach when she told me $30,000 months were possible. And Mm -hmm. now to start to see what is possible just by watching others. And it's so, so important. And I always tell my clients to take a look at their jealousy and, you know, use it as inspiration because Mm -hmm. you can start to see what it is that you want if you're paying attention to what other people are doing and then using it for good and using it for inspiration. I love that. And I love what you just said about the numbers. This is really important is a lot of people want to go from, I just made 2000 a month to 30,000 and they feel like it's too far. So don't try to go there. Like try to go from two to 10 And when you're at 10, you grow to be who you are, who needs to go to 30. And once you're at 30, you grow to the person who can bring in 100 a month or whatever your number is. I think, again, we try to go from zero to 60 or we see and we think that someone else does. And I really want to call that forward because we see this amazing glamour overnight success kind of feeling. I've been in the online industry since 2007 or eight. Like this hasn't been overnight. The stuff that's gathered traction that's gotten me faster, further has happened quickly, but there has still also been an amount of time doing and going. So really look and see that you don't have to go from zero to 30,000 or 100,000 a month. Get yourself to the next level and then get yourself to the next level because it's actually more sustainable growth. You know how they say that thing about when people win the lottery and then they lose everything? It's because they didn't actually grow their who they are to receive the money. And I think that when you, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. You can grow fast, but you do need to go through your growth steps so you can decide to bring in more and more and more. Yeah, I don't know if it was you or someone else, but someone said that to me. They said, you know, be the woman who ha- who makes the $2,000 in a month, then the woman who makes the 5000 the 10000 And it's true because if you're trying to do something and in your bones you don't believe it's possible for you, then you're not going to do it. Mm-hmm. And that's what it feels like sometimes to think about going from the 5000 to the 20000 or to the 60000 But if you do it incrementally, um, then it's so you can feel that it's more possible. Yeah, and I will also say this, the speed speeds up the further you go. So I think you've probably experienced this as, you know, I went from like two or three grand a month to like six grand a month to like 20 grand a month to like 40, like the the growth does happen faster. So no matter where you are today, whatever that number is that you want to go to, it doesn't mean it's going to take a long time to get there, but don't 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 cheat yourself out on becoming that person and then becoming the next version of her. And what you said is crucial. Like be the person. Like I love how every time I see you, you've got your coiffed, you've got your hair done, your makeup's done, but it's more about not what the outer is. It's about you choosing to step forward as one of your highest and best versions. And that is what draws you into the next level. So when everybody does that, and again, it doesn't matter what the outside looks like. It's more about you stepping up as your highest self and being, that's what triggers people coming to you, like all the referrals that happens. It's what people feel that magnetic energy around you and want to be around you and buy from you. But it also lets you become your next level version. Beautiful. So let's get real before we move on to some of the biggest sales tips. So mm-hmm. you're always so positive and for <laughs> all the I Heart My Lifers listening, I love having Laura as a guest in our mastermind and with our top level programs because she brings the most amazing energy and I'm sure everyone can feel that. But tell us about some of the darker moments because <laughs> I know I've been through a lot over the past few years of building my business. So I'm guessing you have too. So can you share a little bit more about any of the dark moments you've been able to move through and how in the past few years? Yeah. And it's funny because I do naturally show up like this, like 90% of the time, but the 10%, like I'm a hot mess sometimes. And so I, (laughs) I think it's important to know who to go to when you have struggles. So I have a primary coach that I work with and I know that if I go to her in my moment of, Oh shit, 
uh, things are not working, I'm freaking out. I can speak to her. She can reflect back to me my own how to help me believe in myself again because it does all boil down to belief. And she's a safe space. She won't let me whine and bitch and complain, but she'll let me get it out, be who I am, and she'll help me have tools to get myself righted. Now, if I, in that scrambly place, went to one of my very good friends who's not in our online industry, and I told them things like, you know, I just signed a $60,000 contract to do an event and I'm afraid about it, She'll have, oh, crap, what are you going to do? And that will drive me back down. So I think having, knowing who you can go to, um, I think another big thing is my husband is so supportive, but part of like how he's so supportive with me, because I am high risk and he's lower risk, is I come to him and I say, I'm thinking about stuff. What do you think? Not permission. Can I do this? It's more of inclusive for him and helping him understand that I'm, in the thinking process, and I haven't done this, but there's another thing that we did that I think really helped our risk tolerance, this is for everybody who's in relationships, is we have an amount every month that I give to him that lets us know all of our, like from the business to us, that lets us pay all of our bills. And having that gives him consistent and stability so he knows I can go be more risky. The place that I always have these moments is in my moments of biggest risk. So it's, I'm sure you guys have all experienced this is when you make the big moment of risk and then you step back and go, what the hell did I just do? Yeah. Yeah. So when I have those moments, again, I have the people around me of who I know I can go to. So I think the other thing that I do is I am very real. What you see is what you get. So when I am in a mess, I may not broadcast it out on my Facebook page, but I might go into my group who I coach and tell them, you're not the only one, you are going through this. And I think believing that you're human, understanding that this happens, knowing it's a moment of time, that's what's really, really important. And choice, it really does boil on choice. I have a thing on my phone. Um, That's so funny, I have to see if I can find it real quick. Uh, It's pink, she's on my phone. Um, And this isn't like the person, I mean like the character pink of who she is on stage. Um, And whenever I get a little stuck, I leverage what would she do? And when I kind of put how she would decide things, like pink wouldn't put out a concert date and be like, hope everyone shows up. I don't know if anyone's gonna buy tickets. She'll put it out. She's probably already got a promoter who's handling everything. And from that energy, I can shift myself and not be dark. Um, But I will say it happens. It even happened this Monday. I had a moment of looking at my bank account and it didn't reflect what I want. And I, and again, it doesn't matter what amounts in there or not. It's different for everybody. But I had that moment of I could go into this, there aren't client cuts coming. I don't have the money. And I decided to look at what was really happening, see a pattern, and then choose to receive support to change it. And I have a lot of tools that I use, mindset and energy, but most of them are starting from a place of identifying it so I can get out of my scramble and then choosing a tool to use to get out of it. Mm, Thank you for sharing that. It helps so much for people to hear that even recently you felt this stuff because everyone thinks like once you get to a certain financial level or you achieve (laughs) something, you know, everything's rosy, but that's not the case. There's always moments, especially when you're so driven and you, you know, desire to do these big things consistently. Those moments Mm -hmm. definitely creep up. Beautiful. Absolutely. So right after the break, I want to talk to you about your top sales tips. I have a few specific questions for you, like how to handle it when a client says they can't afford it, how to handle when someone says they need to ask their husband. (laughs) Those are some of the big ones. So I want to touch on those after the break. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. All right, we're back. It's Emily Williams and Laura Wright. So before the break, we heard all about Laura and how she got to this point, some of the things she does to really shift her energy and her mindset into a place so that those sales come rolling in and she's able to attract incredible clients. So I really want her to give you some specific steps towards your own sales process and share a little bit about how to overcome all of those objections. And I know for me, sales is not a natural thing, or at least it wasn't when I first started. I've shared with you that I 
had 54 no's in a row. And I know you said to stop telling that story, so <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> but um, it was like a big wake up call that mm-hmm. sales, sales is not natural for everyone. And so I mm-hmm. love that this is what you teach and that you're so passionate about. So I'd love for you to just share a little bit about the process you recommend for people listening. Yeah. So here's the cool, important thing. Sales is a skill. Like I think, yes, I innately know how to sell. I remember like doing things as a kid, like not selling. I I was never one of those entrepreneurs that sold stuff, but I knew how to negotiate and get anything I wanted. So yes, it's innate, but it is completely something that you can learn. So here's the number one thing. We have these moments where we get on sales calls and you have a great call and a client signs. And then you have a really crappy call and a client doesn't sign. If you don't know what you're doing on all of those calls, then you don't know what worked and what didn't work. And what usually happens, and I think happened with you with all of your 54 no's, don't worry, I've had I've had no's too as well, uh, is that you weren't following a process that you knew would work. And so why I know, like without a shadow of a doubt, if I talk with 10 people, I will close nine of them, regardless of who they are, is number one, I know who my people are. Like I have always said this, and this is like a pre-step to all sales. If I sit down next to a client, I can, or a a prospective client, I can look over and I'll start laughing. And I've had some people who now work with me who are like, oh, I remember you laughing at me. Um, Is I can start laughing because I know you're one of our gals. And so knowing your clients inside and out. So when they show up on a call, you can either say, yep, let's go, or no, we don't. But also having a process you can follow means that you know every single time what the outcome is going to be. If they are an ideal client, you will get to a yes. So I'll just tell you my process because it's pretty freaking simple. And P.S., what works for me works for me. What works for Emily works for Emily. And that's another important thing about sales is to know you cannot follow someone else's script. And that's why I say process. I in formula. I don't say a script because you can use the magical words that I use and your clients are going to be like, what? And it doesn't work. So here's the five steps. And these are very simple. The first step is to connect. This is the thing I think I always say this is the most important. You've heard this before. But this is the one that's overlooked a lot is I actually take time to chit chat with a person. Um, What you're trying to do in this connection space is show how the two of you are the same. You know, we've always heard, you know, the no like and trust factor. That's who people buy from. In the moment of connection, what you want to show is that we have something in common. I would pick something from Emily, like, oh, my God, that little shelf thing you have in the back. I have one of those uh, flowers. You know, like I'd pick anything that I can see that shows how you and I have something in common. And that's what I do when I connect. The next step is to listen and learn. And this is really crucial. This is the arc of the sale. Forget everything I've said. Just hold on to this part. You need to find out what a person's struggle is and then what their vision is before you sell to them. So first step is connect. Second step I call listen and learn. This is where you find out what are they struggling with. When you find out what they're struggling with, can you even help them? I mean, this is where you really wanna sit down and ask, is this a real no or do you not wanna work with them? Um, You also really need to find out why does their struggle need to change now? This is urgency. If someone does not have a reason why it has to change today, they will not buy. So this is really, really important. Now, most people like to find out what the struggle is and then immediately say, I've got a solution for you, buy my thing. It is very, very hard for someone to buy from a place of struggle. So what you wanna do is identify what their struggle is and then go to their vision. Have them tell you what they actually want. This is, uh, one of my friends is a, a server in a restaurant and he's been doing this for years and loves it. And he says it's the best thing in the world because you walk up to the table and the person says, here's what I want And then all you have to do is bring it to them. He's like, it's the easiest thing in the whole wide world. Well, that's how easy the sales process is. You find out what they're struggling with, find out what they want, and then you give an invitation. That's step four. Your invitation to work together shows that you're the bridge. You're going to solve their struggle and get them to their vision by the work that you do. And this works if you're selling websites or coaching or really anything. And what I do differently and when I give my offers, and this is a little golden nugget, is most people on a sales call give one offer. You know, here's what you're struggling with. Here's what you want. Here's the one way I work with clients. Take it or leave it. And what happens is it's yes or no. I make three offers. I show my VIP luxury way to work with me, the top of top of top. I show the way that most of my clients work with me. And then I do a small bite offer. 
This is a tiny way to take care of one little thing and work with us and see if we work well together. And then suddenly, instead of it being yes or no, it's which way do we want to work together? And then step five, this might also be the step that everyone forgets. This is the close. The close is where you actually complete the sale. You ask for the credit card. You overcome any objections if need be, and you ask that crucial question. I've used crucial a lot of <laughs> which is, how would you like to get started? It can be that simple. So here's the arc of the sale. Always follow this. You can say anything you want during any of these portions to connect with somebody so you create that rapport. Find out how you two have something in common. Listen and learn. Find out what they're struggling with, why they're struggling with it, why it has to change now. Find out what their vision is. What do they actually want? And this is what they're buying. Everyone is buying getting to their vision. And don't worry, if people are coming to you and they're unclear, this is where you can help them get clarity, finding out what they actually want. And then once you know what they're struggling with and what they want, you give an invitation to how you are the bridge that solves this. You can get them out of their struggle, get them to their vision by working together, and then you close. And this, you must, 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 please, 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 take the credit card on the call. It breaks my heart when people call me and they're like, I had three sales calls. And then a couple days later, they say no one paid their invoice. And of course they didn't. They got out of that energy of the sale. So make sure you follow all five. Go from struggle to vision to invitation. And the close happens like that. Oh, I love it. That's total gold. Thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Okay, so thank you for sharing that, Laura, because I think that does make it so simple for people, just those five steps. And you're right, a lot of people will jump right to selling. Um, and it's important to figure out whether the pain point or whatever the thing is that the person needs helps with, help with is actually what you do. Otherwise, like, why do we consider it continue the conversation, right? And I, we've talked about this before. I yeah. think time, sometimes people get no's and I always ask them to go back and look at that no. Did you actually want to work with the person? Usually not. Did they actually have a problem you wanted to help solve? Usually not. It's pretty rare that the no is a genuine, um, like there, it should have been a yes, but it was a no. It's usually a genuine no. Mm, good point. Yeah, I love that. So talk a little bit about some of the objections that come up on these calls, because it mm -hmm. might be someone who you definitely can help, you know, they do want to work with you, yet there's something that comes up, like they don't have the money, or they need to ask their husband, or it's not the right time. I even had someone tell me that she had to plan her daughter's birthday party, so she couldn't work with me. And that birthday <laughs> party was like three months away. Now, yeah. clearly that was an excuse. <laughs> um, so here's yeah, the most important thing is I say sales are love. And what I want you to bring to every one of your calls is love and compassion. Here's what you need to know. Most people, they get onto a call and it's almost a surprise when resistance shows up. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to actually be prepared for it. This makes you different from everybody else who's doing sales is when you get on the call, know this. When a person is going to change, resistance will show up. For some of us, we are practiced at it. You and I have bought many things and done this many times where resistance shows up and we go, oh, there you are, resistance. Of course, let's say yes anyway. But for yeah, a lot I like of to talk about it like taking my mind out and just look at it. Just observe the resistance because it's going to show up. You don't need to make yourself wrong for it, but no, it's there. Right. It's when we have growth. So the ego part of us and um, we have ego and spirit. The ego side wants us to say safe. And safe is whatever is known. And anytime we want to change what is known, we feel unsafe. And so we want to pull back. So knowing that resistance is going to show up and you be prepared for it and know what to say. So here's what I always say is, cool. How about if we look at this? And then people are like, wait a minute. Because usually what happens if someone says, I don't have the money. I need to talk with my husband. I need to think about it. It's not the right time. It's not the right timing of year. I need to do my birthday party. Whatever they say. Most people on a sales call will go, okay, and they'll buy into what you're saying. So what I do is I do a check-in and I say, well, would it be helpful if we just walk through this together? Because nobody wants, nobody wants this. To hear that someone can fix your struggle, to hear that they can get you to their vision, they tell you a way and then you're like, I want it, but I can't have it. So I like to say, let's find a way. So here are the top two that show up. Um, I don't have the money and I need to talk to my partner. This one comes up a lot. So number one, I don't have the money. Here's what I ask. 
let's do a check-in. What's really going on here? Are you unstable with your income? Are you not meeting basic needs? Are you able to pay your basic bills? If you're not, we're not meant to work together. And I give them free resources and I send them to certain people. If someone just does not know how to create the money or is afraid if they make the first investment, they won't be able to make the next payment, we can go from there. So I find out which is true for them. Once we know this, I say, well, how about if we figured out a way to help you come up with the money? Because that's what's really happening is they just don't know how it could happen. So instead of me coaching them and telling them what to do, I activate the brain and I ask them to tell me 10 ways they could come up with the money. And what actually starts to happen is they see possibility. And remember, what people are buying into is they're buying into belief. That's when the sales happens, when the belief is activated, they can do things. So I ask them to tell me 10 ways to come up with the money. If they need to actually come up with the money, I tell them to go take action on all 10. Um, and then they'll go get in motion. And P.S. I'll know if they're coachable because they'll go do the work or they won't. Um, and with this, it helps them start to see possibility. The other thing is I find out what's really going on, because it doesn't matter what any of the, ex the resistance, the excuses are. It boils down to one of two things. Either they do not fully believe in themselves to do what must be done to get what they desire, and that's okay. And I like to say that that's okay. Or they do not fully believe that I'm the one to help them get there. So I ask them, which one is it? Like 90% of the time it's them, not me. But if it's me, I say, well, what do you need to know about me? And it's usually someone who's like, well, who else have you helped or what have you done? And we talk about that. But they don't need to believe in themselves all the way. What usually happens, again, we started talking about this at the beginning of the interview, was everyone wants to go zero to 60. They think that they have to get all the way there. What I like to show people is I believe in you right now and who you are today. And the process of our work together is actually what will grow you into the person to have the things that you want. The other thing that I do with money, and again, why money pops up so much at the end is I talk about money all throughout the sales call. Most people only talk about money at the part where it's like, hey, could you buy from me? And then people get sticker shock and it doesn't matter what your number is. Your number could be $100, but they're going to get sticker shock. But I bring money into the conversation. So when we get there, it's an easy, relaxed thing. So that's what I bring people to. Now, the spouse thing, here's what I know. So I'm not a fan of putting your power into someone else's hands. And you have to be careful because you don't want to bring judgment to a sales call. So I like to give stories of how I interact with my husband. Um, I like to give stories of how my clients interact with their spouses and how they buy to show that it's possible. But here's what I know. Partner, spouse shows up just like ego. They want to keep you safe. So I tell a story and I highly recommend that you go to your rack of stories that you have of working with clients. And I talk about how the client wanted to invest 8,000 in working with a coach. And she went to her husband and she's like, honey, I know I have no money in my business. I need to do this. It's going to work. And he's like, go for it, do it. And then she had an opportunity to step into a $50,000 program. And she said, honey, what do you think? And he said, don't do it. And so she didn't do it. Then she came to me and it was actually a $30,000 investment. And she said, I know this is right, honey, I'm going to do it. We're going to do it. And he said, yes. And she's like, what happened? It was the 50 versus the 30. It had nothing to do with the money. Here's what it was. She was certain and complete in her knowing. And when she went to him, it was as an empowered person asking for the support. When you want to get someone else to buy in, and this works if you're selling to corporate, which is a whole nother interview, but when there's a second party that needs to buy in, if you show up questioning, they will help you undo and stay safe and not do. When you get yourself into a thousand percent certainty, when you know this is what is for you, when you're going to find a way to do it no matter what, and then you ask for the buy-in, the yes will come. Mm, so many amazing pieces there that I want to talk about. But, you know, that final piece where you said you have to get yourself into the certainty, it works in your own relationship, too. Because I know for me, you know, James and I have invested multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars in our own coaching. I remember going to him just very new in my business, wanting to invest in a six figure program. Um, and I had like just hit six figures. I can't I still can't believe that I did that, but it ended up working out. But I was so confident that that was the right fit for me and that it was going to help me scale massively. And it did. Um, mm -hmm. But if I hadn't had that confidence, there's no way that he would have felt okay with us moving forward with that. So mm -hmm. true. And 
That's a key. So when you are buying, just remember the people who are buying for you from you are just like when you make a buying choice. I have to be an absolute yes. If I'm not a thousand percent yes, it's actually a no. And so I have a process that I take myself through to like really check in and see, is this for me? And I evaluate things. And I always set the money aside. Um, I just, I know how you said, like kind of put it aside and like look at the resistance. I take the money out of the equation and I say, if this was zero dollars, is this actually what I want? And I think the other thing is, I don't like to purchase out of fear. Every time I've made a purchase out of fear, which is, if I don't take this now, it's going to disappear. If I don't buy this, I'll never get to this outcome. It is always worked against me. So what you want to do is make sure that you are not creating a fear-based buying experience for your people, which is why I don't use high pressure sales. It's why um, I do have programs that stop and start at certain times, but I also have rolling enrollment type of offers so people can decide later if they want to. But when you keep it so that there's no external false pressure, people don't choose out of fear. And that is what is crucial. So how do you think about it? So I hear what you're saying. But at the same time, I feel like sometimes if there's not some sort of maybe time urgency factor or Mm -hmm. potential price factor, um, Mm -hmm. people will delay. You know, the Mm -hmm. ego gets in the way and it tells you you don't need it now. But if you Mm -hmm. did start now, you could be at a completely different place much sooner. So how do you think about it from that perspective? There's two. Yeah, there's two things I do. One, I tell a story about because I have many clients who have done this. I have a great client, a story who she came to me and she had five weeks left inside of another program. And she's like, I want to wait to start for five more weeks. And we, um, I brought her to a place of if you wait, your opportunity actually changes and you'll be a different person in five weeks. So the thing you want, it's further or different. Um, she said yes and created a million dollar business in eight months. So I tell this story to help people understand waiting it will never happen. Uh, the other thing is when I'm doing my questions during a sales call, the listen and learn phase, I ask, why does this need to change now? I actually find out what their urgency is, not my urgency. So yes, I do still do things like, hey, we're the program opens on April 1st, so in or out, you know, like that is good. But when I know what the actual person's urgency is, all of that disappears. Because I, I like to, again, tell stories. I have a client who came to me who is about to have a baby in three months. And she's like, I want to work with you after the baby comes. I'm like, oh, my God, you don't even know what that's going to be like. Uh, We need to start today. So what if you had everything you wanted before the baby comes? And she said yes. So having stories to show that other people have done it is crucial, but also find out what the reason is. I knew her urgency was a baby. So asking about that, that changes everything and that'll help people from doing the delay factor because you can go back and say, well, the baby's not going to not come. (laughs) It's coming in three months. It's not going to not come. So how are you going to deal if we don't take care of this before it happens? Find out their real urgency. And that's probably so much more powerful because it's personal to them. You're not Mm -hmm. assuming that money or time is going to be the thing that really gets them to move forward. Love Mm -hmm. it. Amazing. Okay, Laura, so we could continue this call for another hour, I'm sure, but we have to end it here. But I'd love to ask you the final question. It's one of my favorite things to learn about my um, guests on the show. So what has enabled you to create a life better than your dreams? Mm. It really, really is about letting myself actually dream and then going for it and getting back up every time I fail. So I used to tell this story this way that um, sometimes I would get down, like those moments when we get down and I go to my husband, I'm like, oh, you know, like didn't work again, something failed. And he said to me one day, he's like, I don't see that. He's like, I think you are the most resilient person I know. You get back up every time. And it really is easy to see every time things don't work, you can focus on that. What he saw in me and what I choose now to see is every time, crap, it gets me every time I say it because the belief part is so important. Every single time I get back up again. And that is the most important thing to remember is to get back up again. And you have the ability to create, have people around you who are cheering you on, who get you. And so no, it's going to happen. We're entrepreneurs. I do 27 things and five catch, three go a little bit further and one works. Yay. 
yay, the one worked. I go there. I go there. Yay, the one worked. And I don't worry about the ones that don't. I really look at how you get back up again and surround yourself with people who just tell you, you got this, you got this. And so that you own it for yourself, you've got this. Mm, beautiful. Sounds like we have amazing husbands in our corner. It's true. It's true. And and no matter where you are in your journey with relationship, have people in your corner, have a team that supports you, have coaches that support you, have friends that support you, seek those people out and be that person for others. Love it. So how can people find you online? Yeah, come hang out with me. Epic at sales, E-P-I-C-A-T-S-A-L-E-S. Super easy. On my website, there is a free PDF where you can get my five steps so you don't have to like think about my hands. You can actually read them. <laughs> um, on Facebook, on Instagram, that's where I hang out. I love doing lives. I'm very visual. I talk with my hands. I talk a lot. Um, come hang out with me. We have a free Facebook group, which is Epic at Sales. And over on Instagram, I am Epic at Sales. I make it very simple. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Laura. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've loved hearing about your story, all the ups and downs, all your resilient moments, and of course, your amazing sales tips. So for everyone watching, I hope you implement what Laura has provided. I hope you see sales as love. And remember that you too can create a life better than your dreams to start taking action today. So until next time, I'll see you soon. And thanks again, Laura. It's been amazing. Thanks, Emily. All right. Talk later. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram at I Heart My Life Now. And did you know, I'm on the radio every single day. Visit americaoutloud.com to download the talk radio app so you can tune in at 8 a.m. Eastern and 1 p.m. GMT.